Welcome. Welcome to all who are gathered here and with us online. Um, whether you are brand new this morning visiting us, or whether you first stepped into the parish hall with the blue chairs in the time of Stuart McCall, you are welcome here. Um, no matter where you are on your faith journey, where you have been, we welcome you to this time of worship this morning. Uh, the energy is palpable. I can feel the, the Holy Spirit moving and, uh, and the radiance in, in each of your faces. So what a joy it is to worship with you today. Um, I want to extend a very special welcome to our special guest and preacher this morning, um, the Reverend Shannon Vance Ocampo. Um, she is the general presbyter of our presbytery. So she is like the pastor to the pastors, um, and she is here on behalf of our presbytery and our family of churches um, to commission this day and to uh, welcome in uh, the new, new pastor team. I want to say a special thank you to Shannon because she was an early supporter of the, um, this innovative triad co-pastor model. Um, believing in and excited for this new season for us. Um, and so we welcome you today, Shannon, and thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, let us worship the Lord. So what happens when we show up to worship? I think we are interrupted. We're interrupted right where we are. We take a break from what seems like our quote-unquote normal lives, and we come here expecting that God is going to do something that God hasn't done before. Or maybe you didn't come here with that expectation at all. But nonetheless, we should, because we should show up in this place thinking that when we do, we will leave better than we were when we arrived. We will leave with a motivation that perhaps was not here before. We will leave having greeted one another in the name of Jesus Christ. We will leave from this place at some point having worshiped God. How can that not be an interruption to our everyday life, but could it also be a motivation for our everyday life? So that when we leave here, we would be bold enough that each and every day we would be called to worship. In moments of despair, we would be called to worship and thanksgiving of God. In moments of joy, we would be called to worship God right where we are, even if it's in the middle of work with a silent prayer. How could it be? If simply showing up for worship at this moment allows us to understand opportunities to worship each and every day of our lives. As we gather here this morning, may that be part of our goal, to find opportunities for thanksgiving and praise for worship wherever we are. Would you please stand as you are able and we'll join together in hymn 619 and worship God together. Welcome back. I hope everyone had an amazing summer. It's so great to see everyone today, and I am really excited to kick this off. And today is a very special Sunday, and for those of you who have not been on my email list, you are now, because I think I caught you all on your way in today. And regardless if you have a backpack or not, we are going to bless you. So everyone from K to 12th grade is invited to come on up now so that Reverend Chris Tate and I can not only welcome you, pray with you, and celebrate your start to the school year. Come on up. Even the high schoolers, everybody come on up. Congregation, these, these kids right here are the future of this church. So smile when you see them come in, smile. God loves you so much and he walks with you everywhere you go. And today, I'm gonna to give this to Chris, today 
we have an opportunity to gift you with a small offering for you to always remember that God is with you wherever you go, good and bad, always with you. Someone who you can silently close your eyes, keep your eyes open, have a conversation with, and know that he will always listen. So today, if those of you who have a backpack can come up here and get them, okay? Come on up. If you have a backpack up here, come on and get it. And as Reverends Mark and Shannon, Jess and Chris, Rodney, you want to come help? Yes. And Rodney, put on the tags. I'm going to say a prayer for all of you. And then you're going to all K through seven is going to follow me. And we're going to go do a fun activity in the back. Okay. Lord, bless these backpacks and keychains and youth before us and those who carry them as they begin yet another school year. Give them peace when they feel nervous, focus when they feel distracted, energy when they feel tired. Open their minds to the lessons they will learn both in and outside the classroom. Help them to make friends that build one another up and be friends to those who need them. Guide them in making good choices as they grow in wisdom and maturity. Be ever present with them in the classroom, on the school bus, on the playground, on the sports fields, and at home. And may they feel your loving care in all they do. Amen. Our prayer confession, let us pray. Eternal and glorious God, you are merciful, you are kind, you are forgiving. You hear us when we come to you with our hearts and minds open. We admit that we don't focus on you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. A day devoted to you is infrequently attempted. We neglect to rest our hearts and minds in you, for we keep going in our own power, our never stop, our go, 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 go. Do not attend to your word, for we live by the words and idols of our age, fail to worship with your people, for we give priority to so many other commitments. Forgive our missteps, our missing the mark, God. Help us to walk in your ways, to honor you in everything that we do. Friends, hear the good news. Through the, the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free. Let us live as free people. And as one of those acts of freedom, let us stand as we're able and greet one another, sharing Christ's peace. The peace of Christ be with you. I feel like that this was the first time that many of you have seen each other in weeks because with vacations and summer schedules, we find ourselves in other places, but how good is it when we get to come back together? When we get together in this place, even though it's a little warm, but we will continue to work on that. The warmness of our hearts, the warmness of our spirits definitely outweighs the warmness of the room. Amen? See, I'm trying to convince you of that. But seriously, as we gather and as we were uh, greeting one another, I certainly felt as if homecoming were already happening, even though that will officially be next week. But it was a good reminder that whenever we gather as God's people, we are home. So this morning in celebration of this home, let us give our gifts, our gifts of time, 
our gifts of volunteerism, our financial gifts, excuse me, <clears throat> whatever gift we have to share this day, know that that gift will call us home even in this very moment to be in the people of God in this place. The morning offering will be received. God, we hear songs of your love raining down and look through windows and see the rain falling to the ground. We long for home and show up in this place and are greeted by name or with a smile and realize that your home is everywhere and wherever we are, we are at home with you. All of your wisdom seems to work together so that we may understand you more fully. Thus, may our offerings do the same. May they be combined together and offer hope to the hopeless, offer home to those who are struggling with homelessness, offer hope and wisdom and love to each and every person in the world so that as they do, we would begin to understand more fully your hope, your wisdom, your love, your home, your reigning down at this very moment. Oh God, we pray all these things in your many names. Amen. This morning's reading is Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 to 46, and it can be found in the New Testament, page 25 of your Pew Bibles. And this is a very familiar, it will be, it will be familiar to you when you hear it uh, passed from the Bible. It's called the Judgment of Nation, Nations, 
and is based on a parable that Jesus tells about sheep and goats. Listen now to God's word for you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, what was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food and, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of those, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God. Holy wisdom, holy word. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here among you, especially on this day of uh, great joy in the commissioning of your free pastor team to lead you as a congregation in this place in Wilton, Connecticut, into the next things that God has in store for you. We don't know what all of them are, but we know that they are present and that they are planned for and that this is where God is leading us. I also want to say thank you to those uh, who are here who have been a part of the life and ministry of our presbytery. Uh, Lauren Tate serves as our uh, chair of our personnel committee, uh, taking good care of our staff. And this has been, if you've been following along in the presbytery newsletter, um, a very interesting year. We got all new staff except for me. So um, uh, we've been doing searches and transitions, and our new staff team uh, is finally Place for the Presbytery, you might know a little bit about how that might feel for an organization having that sort of uh, ups and downs in your organizational life. And uh, Mark also serves on uh, that personnel team, and Chris serves on uh, our nominating uh, team. So uh, thank you to all of you for being part of the Presbytery. I bring you greetings on behalf of the 26 congregations two new worshiping communities, and one immigrant fellowship that make up this presbytery that stretches uh, from Connecticut, uh, all of Rhode Island, and most of Massachusetts, except for the city of Boston, but we do encompass uh, the Cape, which is good for us. So let us pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you. 
O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So when we listen to the passage today from Matthew's Gospel, one of the big questions we might have is, does Jesus judge us? What does that mean? Does Jesus judge us as a society or as a church or as individual people? What does it feel like to you when I use the word judgment? What sort of feelings does that word judgment conjure up for you? Probably not good feelings, right? When I imagine being judged, I start to feel very uncomfortable. I imagine that someone is out there creating ideas in their head about who I am, what I am, how I am, what I do, without even knowing me. They have an idea that's formed in their mind, and it is wrong, and I cannot change it. It's fixed. It's there. And it's wrong. When I hear the word judgment, the first thing I have to say I think about is feelings of being ashamed or hurt, misunderstood, maybe even vilified. Does that resonate with anyone here? But of course, judgment isn't always bad. You could be judged perhaps to win a competition, be judged best. But doesn't your mind, like mine, tend to go to the negative first? I think we go to the negative first when we hear the word judgment because we live in a very judgmental and competitive society. We are programmed from an early age to judge ourselves up against others, to judge others and know we are being judged. It's sort of in the ether. It's part of our society. It's how it functions. I'm not saying that this is a good thing. In fact, I think that it is toxic, harmful, dangerous. But it is the truth about how so much of our society functions. And whether we know it or not, from a very early age, our parents, the adults around us, give us all sorts of messages about how to escape judgment or judge others. Judgment equals negativity. Judgment equals shame. Judgment equals competition. Judgment equals win or lose. So why would I bring up a passage like this one in Matthew's Gospel for a day like today, a day of celebration? Why do we need to talk today about the judgment of Jesus and the hard commandments of ministry that he lays out in Matthew 25. Why today, when we are celebrating a new day in ministry here at Wilton Presbyterian Church with Jessica to judge one of them up against the other? We know that gifts, as the Bible tells us, come to all of us, but not all of us have the same ones. Our giftedness, our capabilities, our from God. You have elected here in ministry to do something that is sort of a jigsaw puzzle, a community of pastors for leadership and ministry. We take vows as clergy and also as elders in the church to be good friends to our colleagues in ministry, and that vow will probably be the most important one in this shared ministry. When we join a church, we say we will be community with each other as we strive to follow Jesus, growing as his disciples. We do not take vows of judgment. We take vows of friendship. And yet at the same time, this passage in Matthew 25, Jesus and the judgment of nations, is the one we are listening to today. A group of my friends, colleagues in ministry, and I wrote these words in 2015 about this portion of Matthew 25. This is what we wrote almost 10 years ago. In the parable of the judgment of nations, Jesus tells a story about how he is encountered among the least, the poorest, the most isolated, 
the imprisoned, the sick, the hungry. We hear with sober conviction Jesus declaring that a church which fails to serve with and for the poor does not know Jesus. We agree with Pope Francis, who stated that a church that is not actively supporting and serving the needs of the poor has no right to call itself a church and should be prepared to give up its tax-exempt status and how it operates as a church in that way. Let us be counted, we wrote, as sheep who meet their king as a stranger. We see the spirit blowing through our society, bringing to fruition seeds of peace and justice long dormant. The harvest will be plentiful. Let us heed the call of service and recommit ourselves to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in deeds as well as in words. These words that this group of colleagues and I wrote together were written as part of the rationale of an overture, which was heading to the Presbyterian General Assembly the following year in 2016. It was that year that the General Assembly voted unanimously to call the Presbyterian Church USA a Matthew 25 church. And over the last four years, that work has been taken up in an organized Matthew 25 ministry that congregations, ministries, governing bodies, individuals all over the Presbyterian Church are signing up to be a part of. A ministry that is focused in three primary areas, eradicating poverty, ending systemic racism, and growing congregational vitality. These things flow from the entire chapter of Matthew 25. Our Presbytery, the Presbytery of Southern New England, voted last year to become a Matthew 25 Presbytery, noting that we are already engaged deeply in two of these foci at the high level, anti-racism learning and supporting, of course, congregational vitality. So are we setting ourselves up for judgment? We are a Matthew 25 church? Absolutely. Jesus talks about judging the works and the... I do not hear him talking about it in a shaming way, but in an encouraging way. That living the gospel is about bringing good news, new life, and an alternative way of being. Jesus puts the bar high in Matthew 25. He doesn't want a half-hearted ministry, an unserious ministry, or a ministry that doesn't face up to the fact that the world then and the way of the world that we live in today is almost always in direct opposition to the values of Jesus. Jesus is judging. And he is also inviting us to judge, to notice when the values of our society that we so blindly follow and treat so much of the time as more important than our faith, leaves us out of step with the way of Jesus and his call to discipleship. For Jesus, judgment equals a call to faith. I'd like to uh, leave you today with a short story from my own life, given what tomorrow is on the calendar, September 11th. In 2001, that fateful year, I graduated from seminary in June, and I began my first call in ministry on July 1st, 2001, in a bedroom community of New York City in Monmouth County, New Jersey, which would turn out to be the county in New Jersey with the highest death toll on 9-11. I was barely two months into ministry when I was sitting at my office on the morning of September 11th, just sitting down, getting my desk organized, beginning my day, looking through my emails, when the senior pastor walked across the church office and into my office and said, come with me across the churchyard over to the manse where he lived to watch TV with he and his wife that a plane had just flown into the World Trade Center. 
We walked across the yard, bringing with us a church directory. We sat in his living room for hours, watching TV, watching more and more of the events of the morning unfold, and making check marks in the directory of how many members we had working in the towers and how many were in the buildings around them. Calls were coming in. Many people at our congregation and community were missing. The next few weeks for me were a blur of memorial services after memorial services, sitting that night with people covered in soot, working later that week in our local emergency room in our hospital with other chaplains as people poured in in the days after 9-11 with all sorts of medical ailments that came from running from the tower and the psychological and mental distress of that day. In that month after 9-11, I know exactly what happened to me. I lost my relationship with Jesus because I was angry and I watched the news at night and I was a little too eager in my mind for war and retaliation. I forgot in those months that the way of Jesus is countercultural. It is a way of total nonviolence. I forgot all of that. And I was in danger, I believe, in those early months of my ministry of becoming the sort of pastor if I had stayed in that stuck place who said that they were leading people to Jesus, but instead I would have been leading people to the values of our society, not those of Jesus. In late October, I went to a meeting with other colleagues and a Roman Catholic priest named Reverend John Deere ministered to us. He helped me that weekend regain my faith and re-remember the Jesus of nonviolence, peace, and Matthew 25. I had to judge myself and allow myself to be judged in order to return to the way of Jesus, in order to be healed. This can happen to all of us. It doesn't take something big like 9-11. It can be the slow drip, drip, drip of living in the United States, being told that we are judged by how much is in our bank account, how much homage we pay to the gods of capitalism, how much we worship violence, war, racism, and guns, how we are okay living in a country of plenty where 37 million people in this country live below the poverty line, one in 10 people in this state, the state of Connecticut. Just as we have to let go of Western and North American ideas around judgment, we also have to let go of imposing our values upon Jesus. Instead, we need to let Jesus impose his way upon us. Let Jesus judge us. And then let Jesus change us. So it is my prayer for all of you and for Jessica and for Chris and for Mark as you officially today begin as a team of pastors and colleagues and friends, all of you together in ministry, that you will work together in ministry. Grow as disciples of Jesus, relearn his ways. Judge yourself and your ministry by the standards of Jesus only. Let go with your new pastors let them help you let go of the Americanization of our faith. Instead, letting an honest relationship with Jesus and his powerful challenge to all of us in Matthew 25 guide you and grow you. Deep blessings to each of you in this season of ministry. Judge it. Let it be judged. Be open to being turned around and set back in the right direction, the direction of the way of Jesus, Prince of Peace.
His way is a way of grace, a way of peace, and a way of love lived out in community. May it be so. Alleluia. Amen. Good morning. Could I have all Wilton Presbyterian staff please come forward to the table? Hear these words of scripture, first from Paul's letter to churches in Galatia and second to the community of faith in Ephesus. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, there is no longer slave nor free, there is no longer male and female. For all are one in Christ Jesus. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as we are called to the one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all called by God to serve with one another in unity and peace, let us affirm our call in this place to our pastors and ministers and to one another as the church of God has gathered together. God of past and possibility, God of history and new things, God of now, God of then, Each moment of our journey is an opportunity for us to offer praise. We give thanks today for Stuart McCall and the Presbytery of Southern New England who visioned a Presbyterian worship community in this town in Wilton and alongside the first members of this congregation nurtured it into being. We give thanks for the saints who have led us to a deeper understanding of Christ to Shannon White, to David Graybill, to Steve Jacobs, to Doug Lind, to Charlotte Lorenz, to Rebecca Seegers, and Jane Field, Sherry Richards, and Jamie Lewis. Their voices, combined with those of the faithful members of this congregation, speak your name as one of compassion, justice, salvation, and hope. Thanks be to you, God. Today we rejoice and give thanks for Allison, Chris, Jessica, Julie, Mark, and Rodney, and for their response to your call. As we add their names to the leaders of our church and as they fulfill your call to them and to the work we share at Wilton Presbyterian, may they know your love, support, guidance, challenge, and kindness. Amen. Friends, the grace bestowed on you in baptism is sufficient for your calling because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in the faith and to commit our lives in ways that serve Christ. God has called you to a particular service. Show your purpose by answering these questions. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, I will with God's help. Do you welcome the responsibility of this service because you are determined to follow the Lord Jesus, to love neighbors and to work for the reconciling of the world? If so, respond with, I do. Do you promise to take care of yourself, time away, time to care for your own family, practices that support your own psychological health, emotional maturity, and spiritual health, so that you may be better equipped to take care of others, promising to consistently and continually seek balance between self-care and congregational care? So respond, I do. Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit? 
If so please respond, I will, with God's help. Will the congregation please stand as you are able? Do you, members and friends of Wilton Presbyterian Church, promise to support these leaders God has called to be in service among you? If so, please respond, we promise our support. Do you promise to consistently seek the ways of love and compassion? If so, please respond, with God's grace we do. As individuals, do you promise to take care of yourselves by saying yes only to things you have time for, engaging in practices that support your psychological growth, emotional maturity, and spiritual health, and engaging with Wilton Presbyterian in worship and service, that in doing so, you may find a balance in your own life that allows you to be a part of this community in healthy and faithful ways. So please respond, I do. With gratitude for the Holy Spirit that connects us, the Christ who redeems us, and the God who creates us anew, let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Friends, by the grace of God, redemption of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, you have been called together in ministry. Now through our actions today, we join in mutuality and reaffirm our covenant together to share in faithful ministry here at Wilton Presbyterian Church. May God bless you and keep you today and always. Amen. I charge you today to go out into God's world in peace, trusting Jesus, who judges each of us, not with a judgment of shaming or blaming, a judgment of invitation to ministry, a judgment of grace, judgment that leads to love. And now may that love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and love of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you on this day and in the days to come. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>